The following is a non-verdict-based research versus show. The stats of the individual characters are not taken into consideration when determining aspects of the fight. However, the characters themselves are going to be represented in their fullest capacity outside of stats. This is versus universe. Fire. A flame burning so hot, it can melt nearly anything. Met with intense human passion, could become something even more. A flame meant to protect. But the journey there was not easy. Even so, these leaders will take their power in stride to do the best they can, all while carrying the highest honor a man can handle. Zuko, the Fire Lord from Avatar. Roy Mustang, the Flame Alchemist from Full Metal Alchemist. Let's begin! Water. Earth. Fire. Air. Long ago, the four nations lived in harmony. Then, everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. Over the course of a hundred years, the militaristic might of the Fire Nation made almost all the world bend to their will, but only one could oppose them. The Avatar, master of all four elements. However, before he could help in the fight against the Fire Nation, he vanished without a trace. See, the world of Avatar features four major nations. The already mentioned Fire Nation, the Water Tribes, the Earth Kingdom, and the Air Temples. And since the current Avatar was living with the Air Nomads, the Fire Nation just like... committed a full-on genocide. They were so thorough that it was thought the Avatar had long since been dead, and the threat he'd present on the Fire Nation would be non-existent. Flash forward about three generations, and the current Fire Lord was that of a man named Ozai, who had two children, the prodigal and ever-adored Azula, and the black sheep of the royal family, Prince Zuko. Growing up, Ozai as a father was... Uh, not great. He clearly favored Azula due to her bending ability being just kinda better than Zuko's in every way, and the only person he really trusted, his mother, suspiciously vanished without a trace one night, leaving him truly alone. Flash forward a little bit, and as a burgeoning teenager, his dad invites him on a war council. Zuko is, after all, supposed to succeed Ozai should anything happen to him. But after suggesting they don't sacrifice people for literally no reason other than a strategic advantage, he was challenged to a one-on-one -on -one firebending duel, an Acne Kai. Except, the one greeting him was not the general to which Suko thought he dishonored. Instead, it was his father. Begging for forgiveness, Suko simply fell slack to his knees and pleaded for his father to stop this. Only he didn't. And ever since then, Zuko bore a scar on his right eye, and was exonerated from the Fire Nation altogether. The only thing that could restore his honor was, to put it simply, a fool's errand. To find and capture the long-missing Avatar. And Zuko was relatively well equipped to handle the job. Relatively. So like there's this thing called bending in the Avatar universe, it's pretty popular, you've probably heard of it. If you're born to one of the four nations, there's a chance you'll have the tricks of the trade necessary to master one of the four elements. There is a chance you won't have this ability, some people just aren't born with bending capabilities and that's okay. We're a non-eugenics type show at Versus Universe. Zuko, since he was born into Fire Nation royalty, was basically destined to be a great bender. So, all benders base their movements around a real-life Chinese martial art, and firebenders take inspiration from North of Shaolin Kung Fu. This style uses powerful hand and leg movements, and makes it so that fire is more of an extension of one's body than anything else. Also important, every other style of bending needs a source to control, but firebending comes from the person's inner chi, or life energy. Using that and harnessing it through emotions, they can do some wacky stuff. Kill me. Using all that, people have figured out some crazy shit you can do with fire. Like, sure, you could blast it out your hands and feet, but what if you took two blasts together and made it even more powerful? Or, or what if you were to use it for defense purposes, protect yourself in a cocoon of flame? Not to mention making fire daggers to fight with, or even propelling yourself either on or off the ground. But all of that pales in comparison to the most dangerous form of firebending. Lightning. Bending. 
Only the very top of the food chain can even attempt this technique, and its destructive force is nigh unparalleled against any other type of bending. Zuko also likes swords. Two swords. Dual wielder Zuko. Why is this a trend this season? Two? Speaking of bending, Zuko spent much of his time after exile searching the nations he could with his uncle, a kind soul named Iroh. His results remained lackluster until one day, a random iceberg near the Southern Water Tribe was discovered, and lo and behold, the Avatar was holed up in there. A young airbender, the boy went by the name Aang, and finding and capturing him quickly became Zuko's main prerogative. Through a long cat and mouse game, Zuko eventually succeeded, but realized something. The victory he felt was hollow. He wasn't doing this because it was his destiny. He was just being sent on a journey he wanted nothing to do with, all because he just wanted to go home. He nearly died out in the blizzard, but he was, ironically, saved by the very thing he was sworn to capture. The Avatar. In a fit of rage, he kinda accidentally, not at all accidentally, murked this dude he had beef with, and was branded as a true traitor of the Fire Nation because of it. With nowhere else and no one else to go to after abandoning his uncle, Zuko wandered the Earth Kingdom alone. He tried his best to be a good Samaritan, but ultimately, he found the hard truth of the world. The Fire Nation was not liked by anyone other than themselves, and everywhere he went just further perpetuated the conflict, to the point where he ended up using firebending as a last resort, and the moment he did use it, he was immediately shunned. Feeling as if the entire world was against him, he returned to the one place of comfort, his uncle. They tried to live a peaceful life in anonymity. Zuko even went on a date, good for him, good for him, but their past caught up with them the second the Avatar showed up. Zuko ended up spiraling, still driven by his desire for honor, even after being labeled a traitor. And when Azula showed up, well, Zuko fully relapsed. He joined with his sister and was set for a full pardon for his past crimes. Not his uncle, though. Iroh went on to become a prisoner, thanks to Zuko's actions. And using lightning, Azula seemingly killed the Avatar. Everything was looking up for Zuko in his little bubble of the world. But those feelings of regret he held during his time in exile never fully waned. And he decided to finally own up about the conflicts that lie deep in his person and confront his father. In that throne room, Zuko said all that he could, telling his father that the Fire Nation was not all that it's cracked up to be. Eugenics may be bad, but you know what's worse? Fascism. Just full on Nazis. I hate Nazis. And so should you. Leave a comment if you hate Nazis. Then, he dropped a bombshell he himself probably didn't expect at first, but it was the logical conclusion of his entire journey. Through thick and thin, there was one constant. The Avatar. And so, instead of his attempted attainment, Zuko was determined to save and help Aang learn firebending, because, you know, he can use all the elements and had been looking for a firebending teacher. But not before his dad lightning bended at him, but Zuko did something he could have only learned from his uncle. He redirected the lightning through his body, channeling the attack and flowing it back out through his opposite arm. Now determined more than ever to redeem himself for his past mistakes, Zuko took all the necessary actions to do just that. It's just that he's an antisocial baby with the charisma of a cauliflower. It took a bit of doing a road trip with every single member of Team Avatar except for the blind one to convince them he was on their side, and when he did, he managed to teach Aang how to firebend and kill his dad. But on the fated day that Aang would confront the Fire Lord, Zuko had his own mission, to take down his sister. But she was uh, not really of sound mind. It all came down to one last Agni Kai. Both parties fought valiantly, enhanced by the power of Sozin's Common in the sky. But once Azula tried to kill the person who was there with Zuko, all bets were off. In a way, killing any honor this fight had. But Azula got defeated by the power of water, fire's natural enemy. And Aang defeated the Fire Lord. A new day was dawning in all four nations, ringing in with a new Fire Lord, Zuko, and his friend, the Avatar, Aang. Zuko learned something valuable. Though scars may never fade, they are not what define us. They are simply reminders of the past, and the past can be moved past. 
but it can also never be changed. And taking both of those truths into account makes a man realize just what true honor is. My name is Zuko, son of Ursa and Fire Lord Ozai, Prince of the Fire Nation and heir to the throne. Alchemy, the science of understanding, deconstructing, and reconstructing matter. However, it is not an all-powerful art. It is impossible to create something out of nothing. If one wishes to obtain something, something of equal value must be given. This is the law of equivalent exchange, the basis of all alchemy. But alchemy is as vast as the user's imagination, leading a lot to study it as a science to truly understand its secrets. While some employ it for pure academia, there are others who are solely after the power the art grants you. And sometimes you don't find power. Power finds you. Such was the case of Roy Mustang, the Flame Alchemist. From a young age, Roy was set on joining the Amestrian forces, and did just that, but not without pursuing the art of alchemy himself. He was taught by this old fuck, Berthold Hawkeye, who showed him the basic principles of alchemy. Comprehension, understanding what you're changing, deconstruction, breaking what you understand apart, and reconstruction, reforming it into the image you so will. Berthold kinda died, he's old, old people tend to do that, and so entrusted Roy with both his secret alchemy technique as well as looking after his daughter, Riza Hawkeye. Roy told Riza his ultimate goal, to strengthen the military's resolve from the inside, and help all those he could along the way. Thinking that she found the right person to know her father's secret, she took off her shirt, not like that, and laid bare the etchings she had hid her entire life. The secrets of flame alchemy. Deciphering its components, Roy quickly learned how the art worked. He had truly become the Flame Alchemist. He was quickly put to work as a state alchemist, the highest honor for an alchemist in the military, and was appointed to the station of Master. This was due to Flame Alchemy kind of being busted. And that, in turn, is due to how this ability just works. With those special gloves and the transmutation circles on them, Roy can control the very oxygen surrounding us. He manipulates the density of said oxygen, and guides the spark made from his gloves between himself and his target. The result? Kaboom. But Roy's flames aren't just any ordinary pyre. No, no, no. He can control them on a molecular level. Cause all alchemy is based around... Molecules. Science, bitch. But enough of that nerd shit, let's get back to what's cool. Dying in a fire. <laughs> Roy has created flames as big as a gigantic pillar or as small as an eyeball, with the same intensity to their flames. These skills served him well enough to gain the rank of state alchemist, as said before, but that rank does not come without its downsides, such as... Genocide. So like, yeah, that's a thing that happened. What officially was called the Ishvalan Civil War in reality was the ordered slaughter of an entire country. The Ishvalan War of Extermination, it would be named. And Roy was quite possibly the largest component to the slaughter. His ability to conjure large explosions with a mere gesture of his hands, well, it was invaluable. To a mistress, he didn't like having to do it, but he had to do it in order for his dream to come true his dream of truly protecting those by way of his own strength. Though he is certainly more down on the prospect now, as a proponent of genocide, his dream never truly died. The flames just flickered a little dimmer than usual. After the war, he went back home to rest and... do what Roy Mustang does. What the Roy doing? Just Roy things. Sparkle on, it's Wednesday, don't forget to flirt with a woman. Except that his bestie from way back when, Mace Hughes, fucking died thanks to sticking his nose where he maybe shouldn't have. And this sent Roy down a severe spiral. Now motivated by revenge as much as one for change, he spent a lot of his time after Hughes' death while trying to figure out what he found out that warranted a death, and trying to figure out who was responsible. 
Along the way, he found himself in many scraps with those that are called homunculi, or people that are purely made from alchemy. One of them, Lust, tried to kill him, and she nearly succeeded, before he burned her to a crisp. But something else is different about her, and all the homunculi in general. Their power source. They were powered by something called Philosopher Stones, which are little red gems that severely amplify an alchemist's power. But, because of equivalent exchange, you can kind of imagine that the way this power is drawn out is horrific, and you'd be right! All Philosopher's Stones are made up of several human souls, and the more souls, the more powerful the effect of the stone. This was why the Amestrian army had been killing forever, to create more powerful Philosopher's Stones. But Roy's flame alchemy, being as destructive as it is, can even burn the most powerful thing that was literally designed to be all-powerful. Insane. So. Fucking. Insane. Eventually, he did meet Yuzu's killer, another homunculi named Envy, and Roy was having none of that shit, so he went on a bit of a warpath against the poor guy. I say poor guy like they haven't murdered so many people and don't delight in their murder, but fuck it, they just a little guy. But Roy? Roy didn't care. He just wanted revenge. Revenge at all costs. He kept burning envy, flame after flame scarring the homunculi's skin. And to be fair, these homunculi have regenerative abilities, and Roy was doling out fire blasts so fast, it literally didn't matter. Envy had to run for their life, and Roy was essentially a wild beast on the hunt for his prey. But his steadfast companion, who had been with him the whole time, Riza Hawkeye, managed to calm him down from the revenge lane stupor, and he allowed Envy to die a death on their own terms. And then, he ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time and was chosen for some fucking death cult or some shit and saw the Gate of Truth. And the way that works is that you can do alchemy without a transmutation circle, but you give up a part of your body. And Roy involuntarily gave up his eyesight. Blind Fireboy. Fireboy gets his eye messed up. Where have I heard that before? But he helped fight against the guy that made the homunculi, Father, as much as he could as a blind man. And after the battle, since the old one died, Roy was named the new Fuhrer of a Mastress. After all these long years, and a lot of colleagues, including the man he would call his best friend, gone. His dream never wavered. He still was helping people through his actions in the military. He gave the title of Fuhrer a ray, but, you know, he didn't really need that. He got his blindness cured due to a Philosopher's Stone and set his sights, once again, on the future of a Mastress, with his lieutenant by his side. But if you stoke the pyre of the Flame Alchemist, he will not hesitate to show you just how dense fire can truly be. You were stupid enough to confess, and even more stupid to boast. Everything you've said is fuel on your funeral pyre. So then, I think I'll begin. By burning out your tongue! We open to a shot of a gigantic arena, in the middle sitting the Fire Lord, Zuko. Having bested all of his challengers in the annual Agni Kai tournament, he awaits the end of his long, long day of fighting. However, a newcomer approaches the battlefield. Covered in military decorations and his signature gloves, Roy Mustang stands alone in a quite impressive, if noticeably empty, stadium, hiding his left hand in his pocket. Hey, are you the Fire Lord? Zuko turns his shoulder to look at the lone wandering alchemist, meeting him face to face. I am. Here for the tournament? There's not a lot of time left. Well, not exactly, though I wouldn't mind a quick spar. I come from the land of a mistress on a diplomatic mission. Zuko looks perturbed at this information, not recognizing the name Roy had just said. I have no recollection of any nation under the name of... A mistress. Well, I had no idea any of these four nations existed either. I guess we're both learning something today. Then how about I teach you the custom of Agni Kai? Roy seems a little disinterested, but figures that any information on the culture of this land would be invaluable. Sure, why not? What is it anyway? Some kind of militaristic initiation? More like trial by combat. Sure you still want to see? As long as you promise to go easy on me. I'm not much of a fighter. Very well, Amestrian. Let's see how you fare against fire! 
Zuko then begins to throw a few fireballs out of his fists, moving his legs in tandem with his hands stretching outward. As the blasts reach the flame alchemist, he ducks and weaves his way through the flames, taking note of how Zuko seems to fight. Seems like his ability is tied to his movements. Interesting. It's not like alchemy the slightest. As more fireballs come Roy's way, the alchemist snaps his fingers once and creates a giant wall of fire, blocking the path of Zuko's comparatively small blast of flame. What was that? That wasn't bending. Impressive. Now try to keep up! And now it's Roy's turn to send fire blast after fire blast Zuko's way, creating combustible oxygen mere inches from the Fire Lord's face. To combat this, Zuko begins to fly around using his bending, propelling himself off the ground and taking flight with his fire in both his hands and feet. Think I can't hit a moving target? There's a reason I'm in charge. Zuko then lands right behind Roy, but before the Fuhrer can keep up, the Fire Lord uses his superior expertise of martial arts and sweeps Roy right off of his feet, creating an opening for a barrage of attacks. All charged with the power of fire, a punch lands on Roy's abdomen, before being kicked in the face and sent tumbling backwards, quickly regaining his composure as his hand holds his entire body from stumbling backwards. You aren't a bender, yet you can control fire. Your culture must be something else. Well, you don't know the half of it. Maybe if you end this fight now, I'll tell you all about it. There's something we people of the Fire Nation have. Honor. So I intend to see this through to the very end. Alright then. BURN! Suddenly, a massive pillar of flame comes bursting from the ground where Zuko had been standing, signaled by a single solitary snap from Roy Mustang's custom-made gloves. Surprisingly, he finds that the Fire Lord had no damages sustained after such an attack. In fact, he seemed almost more alive than before. To defend himself, it appeared he used the flames Roy produced to create a cocoon of fire around him, protecting from any damage that could have been done. Petty trick! Where's your honor, Amestrian? Right here! Then, more and more pillars begin to erupt around Zuko. As the scarred air takes to the skies once more, he can see clearly below something he brought in case of emergency or foul play in the tournament, his dual swords. He makes a quick beeline for the blades, but Roy is quick to catch him. He starts sending small blasts again, knowing that Zuko cannot defend himself while flying. While he misses most, a select few land and damage Zuko, scorching parts of his outfit off. But after a few moments of that cat and mouse chase, Zuko reached his destination and grabbed at his blades. Seeing the Fire Lord deciding to up his arsenal, Roy retorts sarcastically. <laughs> so much for honor. Okay. My swords will spill no blood tonight. They are merely tools. And I will guide them with my body! And with a slash, flames spill out of the very blade swung by Zuko. Indeed, he is using his bending to channel fire through his weapons. As the horizontal string of fire aims at Mustang, all he can do is put his hands up defensively and take the blow, knocking him back just as he had done to Zuko previously. Okay, you're strong. But so am I! And as Zuko is preparing to hurdle another lob of fire through his blade at Roy, the ladder snaps once more, meeting in the middle, and then a massive shockwave encroaches the entire arena. The two masters of fire now showcasing their full power. The demonstration rocked the very core of the arena they were fighting in. The rock and rubble beneath them begins to crumble, they both tumble downward toward what appears to be a Fire Nation monastery. With a gift shop, this was a sporting event after all. Suko gently floats down, but Mustang was not so lucky. He fell down and smacked his stomach first into the floor, groaning in pain as he manages to get himself back up. So it looks like we're pretty equal in power. Not quite. Suko then calmly walks over to Roy, who is still groaning in pain, and takes his glove off of his right hand. It wasn't simple. Figuring out where your power came from. But there was one key factor that was always present when you attacked. A snap of the fingers. I can only assume it's because of these gloves with this weird pattern on them. Suko then takes his blade, and after tossing the glove up into the air, slices it to ribbons. Now, you are disarmed. Do you yield? 
Now, there's something you've got to understand about Amestrians. Hmm? We don't give up that easily! Roy then secretly takes out his left hand, the one he's been hiding the entire time, and starts to snap right behind where Zuko is standing. However, as Roy sits below him, snapping, and Zuko stands above, watching, time seems to stand still. Zuko knows what this means for him. His hand! Lightning! Zuko then outstretches his own hand to catch the lightning, and through channeling it into his body, begins to redirect it. However, this was no ordinary lightning. As it passes through Zuko's body, he begins to squeal in pain and suffering, before finally releasing it out of his other hand. Gasping for air, the Fire Lord and Fuhrer switch places, as Zuko is now on his hands and knees while Roy Mustick stands above him. Do you have any idea of the power you command? Of course I do. I have to, to protect everyone close to me. They call me the strongest alchemist, you know. Not because I'm physically strong, but my flames. They're the most deadly form of alchemy we've come up with. I know what to do with this power, and I know it can't go into the wrong hands. You sound a lot like someone I know. He also held great power. Power greater than my own. I was a fool and tried to prove that I could beat him, but ultimately I was always too weak. This scar shows my weakness, but weakness is not a bad thing. It is a motivator to become strong, to wield true strength. Where'd you hear that? A mentor? Mm-hmm. My uncle. I have someone like that, too. I trust her judgment over anybody else's. And I trust her to make sure I don't do anything stupid. Seems like we have more in common than just fire. Yeah, but you still destroyed a custom-made glove. That cost the government a fortune to make. I don't see this ending entirely friendly. Then let's have a true competition. I will lay down my arms, and we will both come at this with all the power we've got. Winner takes all. The last time that happened, I kind of ended up falling to my near death. You sure it's safe in here? Yes. We use it for firebending practice all the time. Tons of Agni Kais happen here. Alright. Winner takes all. I like the sound of that. The two prepare their final blast of fire at the other, certain that any way this fight between the two Lords of Flame may end, it would certainly go down in a blaze of glory. As the flames dissipate in the cloud of controlled smoke, a wounded Roy Mustang kneels on one knee, clearly taken aback by Zuko's fire. As the Fuhrer sits there, he smirks, knowing he's been bested by somebody he now tentatively respects. Looks like you win, Fire Lord. And you lose. What do I call you? Well, my name is Roy. Roy Mustang. But in my country, they call me the Flame Alchemist. Alchemist? You don't know what alchemy is, do you? I can't say I do. Your ways confuse me, but I don't wish to speak from a place of ignorance. If it's alright, I'd like to learn. Well, I can't say I wouldn't like to learn about your fire, too. How does it work? Bending? Well, it's... Uh... Huh. I don't really know how to explain it. I was never a good teacher. <laughs> There'll be plenty of time for me to learn from someone more qualified. First things first. Let's talk about this alchemy. From what I've seen, it seems to be a force for either great destruction or even great construction. If you can prove to me its worth, the Fire Nation and the Mestris may just become friendly neighbors with each other. Roy then begins to get up, still sore, but able to move. You may not be a teacher, but you've got a knack for leading a country. <sighs> you know, I find it hard to be a leader myself. What motivates you to lead? As Zuko steps out of the dojo, he sees the people he rules over. A bustling city of workers, performers, men, women, children, all of them flooding into his view like rain in a shallow alley. He is filled with pride, and can remark at the flame alchemist with just one single word to describe how he feels and what motivates him to become a better person. Honor. And as he looks on at the now setting red sun, Zuko can help but smile, 
as Roy walks up to him and stands at his side. The future of both the Fire Nation and Amestris is shining as bright as the sun. But like all flames, eventually it'll die out. As the flames dissipate in a cloud of controlled smoke, a wounded Zuko falls to his knees in defeat. Roy stands his opposite, facing away from the Fire Lord as he begins to walk away. This alchemy, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. You must tell me everything you know about this. Roy stops dead in his tracks, thinking back to the promise he made to keep Flame Alchemy's ins and outs a secret of the highest order. The horror that came with making that information public still troubles him after all this time. And if these people had the power of alchemy, who's to say they wouldn't go after another Ishval? After much careful thought, for the first time since getting here, Roy claps his hands and creates a large dome out of the stone decorating the floor, using traditional alchemy in front of Zuko for the first time. The ball falls to the ground, and Zuko is left to gape at the power at this man's disposal. There's more to this power than you will know. I've spent much of my life in the pursuit of keeping this a secret, and I intend to keep doing that, no matter what. Zuko slowly lifts himself off the ground. If you won't share it, I believe I have to trust in your judgment. Carry on, Flame Alchemist. Upon hearing words he wasn't expecting, Roy takes another moment to consider Zuko's complacency. The ability to see great power and not try and attain it instead of instigating a war just for pursuit of power takes true strength. Before he leaves, Roy slips off his still remaining glove and tosses it to Zuko. As the Fire Lord catches it, Roy speaks one last time. Here, a souvenir. If you can figure it out, I'll congratulate you. It's not simple, but I think I have to trust in you as well. And one last thing before I leave. Hmm? Do me a favor and call me Roy. Roy Mustang. Suko then smiles faintly before walking away himself, glove in hand. You may call me Zuko, Roy Mustang. As they both go their separate ways, Roy, with a new confidant in both Zuko and his country, and Zuko with a secret technology to be uncovered, Roy steps out of the building for the first time. And seemingly as if signaled by his departure, a speck of rain hits his head. And another, and another, until suddenly a downpour hits the streets of the Fire Nation capital. Roy has but one single thought. He can't help but speak out loud as he sees the storm brewing. Rain, for once, I welcome you. Oh boy, oh boy, it's a fire. Fire, 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 fire. Vanquish my enemy. Oh wait, no, that was lightning. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about this. So like the main thing I wanted to illustrate in the fight is that Zuko is much more of an experienced combatant than Roy ever was. Sure, Roy's been in a few scraps, but he's not a martial artist like Zuko is. He heavily relies on Flame Alchemy to get much of anything done, and while he does have military training, I don't think that much would apply to a master martial artist fighting you. But inversely, Roy's fire presented a real problem for Zuko. Unlike his flames, which had to extend out from his body, all Roy had to do was snap and anywhere on the battlefield a gigantic burst of flames could erupt. And again, they could be as precise or imprecise as he wanted. However, it is still fire, and Zuko can control the flames that Roy creates just like any other fire nearby. So the real crutch comes in their secondary arsenals, of which Roy has regular alchemy and Zuko has his dual swords. So without something else to fall back on, Zuko would for sure get the upper hand. I mean, the boy took out an entire compound without using firebending, granted with Aang's help, so he clearly knows his way around those swords. But Roy has access to flame alchemy as long as he keeps those gloves on, and even if he didn't, well, he does have access to alchemy without a transmutation circle. And since that's heavily based around the environment Roy finds himself in, well, it's more situational than Zuko's swords for sure. So in raw power, Roy outclasses, but in versatility and adaptability, Zuko takes the cake. 
It all comes down to what happens, and I don't know, I think I presented a full little example of it. Remember, we don't ask who would win, we ask what would happen. So, tell us all about your thoughts on this episode in the comments below, and I'll see you for the very next episode of Versus Universe. Bye!